Mathematically speaking, a sphere is a two-dimensional surface in a three-dimensional space, like the surface of a ball. Similarly, a circle is a one-dimensional curve in a two-dimensional plane. When we describe a solid object as spherical, we mean that the object forms a surface in 3D space that is a sphere. And recall from geometry that the volume contained in a sphere is given by 4 thirds pi radius cubed. An oblate spheroid is a special type of ellipsoid which we can think of as a flattened sphere. The volume contained in an oblate spheroid is given by 4 thirds pi a squared b where A is the equatorial radius and B is the polar radius. The surface of the Earth is very closely approximated by an oblate spheroid since there is a slight elongation along the equator. The equatorial radius of the Earth is 6,378.1 kilometers while the polar radius of the Earth is 6,356.8 kilometers. So let's calculate the mean volumetric radius of the Earth. Okay, so we want to determine the uniform radius R that gives the same volume as the oblate spheroid with equatorial radius A and polar radius B. So we have R cubed is equal to A squared B, so that R is the cubed root of a squared b. So the mean volumetric radius of the earth is the cubed root of the equatorial radius of the earth squared which is 6378.1 kilometers times the polar radius of the earth which is 6356.8 kilometers. So to five significant figures, this is 6,371.0 kilometers, which is the same as 6.371 times 10 to the third kilometers, or 6.371 times 10 to the sixth meters. So now that we know the mean volumetric radius of the Earth. We can use this value to calculate the mass of the Earth. So recall that the acceleration due to gravity near the surface of the Earth is the universal gravitational constant times the mass of the Earth divided by the radius of the Earth squared so that the mass of the Earth is the acceleration due to gravity near the surface of the Earth times the radius of the Earth squared divided by the universal gravitational constant. To three significant figures, the acceleration due to gravity near the surface of the Earth is 9.81 meters per second squared. The radius of the Earth we just calculated as 6.371 times 10 to the sixth meters and the universal gravitational constant to three significant figures is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th power meters cubed over kilogram per second squared which to three significant figures is 5.97 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. Now 10 to the 24th is the same as 10 to the 12th times 10 to the 12th. And so the mass of the Earth is 5.97 trillion trillion kilograms. Now recall that the orbit of a planet about the Sun is an ellipse with the Sun at one of the foci of the ellipse. The point on the orbital path where the planet is closest to the Sun is called perihelion, and the point on the orbital path where the planet is the greatest distance from the Sun is called aphelion. Now the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit about the Sun is 
0.0167, so it is very nearly a circular orbit. The perihelion of the Earth is 147.09 million kilometers, while its aphelion is 152.10 million kilometers. Now, because the orbit of the Earth about the Sun is an ellipse and is not a perfect circle, we speak of the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, and this is called an astronomical unit. So one astronomical unit is one half of the sum of the Earth's perihelion and its aphelion. So this is one half of the sum, 147.09 million kilometers plus 152.10 million kilometers, which is 149.60 million kilometers. And this is the same as 1.4960 times 10 to the 8th kilometers or 1.4960 times 10 to the 11th meters. Now this is a huge distance. Let's compare this to the diameter of the Earth. So the ratio of one astronomical unit to the diameter of the Earth is the ratio of one astronomical unit to twice the radius of the Earth. which is 1.4960 times 10 to the 11th meters divided by 2 times 6.3710 times 10 to the 6th meters which to 5 significant figures is 1.1741 times 10 to the 4th which is approximately equal to 12 times 10 to the third, that is, the one astronomical unit is about 12,000 times the diameter of the Earth. Only last year, a new binary star system was discovered from images recorded by NASA's Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, WISE for short. This binary star system, known as WISE 1049-5319, consists of two brown dwarf stars and at a distance of about 6.6 .6 light years away it is the third closest star system to our Sun discovered so far. Now a light year is the distance traveled by light in a vacuum after one average year and for a constant speed the distance traveled is equal to that speed times the time so one light year is equal to the speed of light in a vacuum times one average year. Now, in one average year, there are 365.25 days, and in one average day, there are 24 hours, in one hour, there are 60 minutes, and there are 60 seconds in one minute. So in seconds, one year is equal to 3.15576 times 10 to the seventh seconds. And so one light year is equal to the speed of light in a vacuum, which to five significant figures is 2.9979 times 10 to the eighth meters per second times the period of one year in seconds, which is 3.15576 times 10 to the seventh seconds. And so to five significant figures, one light year is 9.4606 times 10 to the 15th meters. So as an exercise, 
Determine the number of astronomical units in one light year and express your answer to two significant figures. And as a second exercise, determine the average time in minutes required for light from the sun to reach the earth. And once again, express your answer to two significant figures. Okay, so now we will begin to consider the motion of an object. Motion is the change of an object's position with respect to time. And in general, there are two basic types of motion, translational motion and rotational motion. Translational motion is the motion in which all the particles of an object move through the same distance in the same time, while rotational motion is the motion in which all the particles of an object move through the same angle with respect to a fixed point in the same time. Real-world motion of macroscopic objects is usually a combination of translational motion and rotational motion. Now we analyze the motion of an object by building a model, which is a simplified and idealized system that mimics the behavior of objects in the real world. Our model must be able to describe the motion of the object, which is the domain of kinematics, and also explain the motion which is the domain of dynamics. Now if the motion of an object does not depend on its size or shape, we can model the object as a particle, which is a mathematical point containing all the mass of the object. So let's consider the motion of a ball that is allowed to roll along a straight line. This object has both translational motion and rotational motion and this object is rotating about its center of mass. So if we focus on the translational motion of the object, then we can treat this object as a point particle. That is, we can model this object as though all its mass were located at its center of mass. Now, one description of motion that we have already considered is speed. The speed of an object is the distance that the object travels divided by the time required to traverse that distance. But notice that if I describe the motion of an object by its speed, then I have only given a partial description of its motion that does not allow me to predict its location after an elapsed amount of time. For example, suppose I have a particle that is moving at a constant speed of 2 meters per second if this particle is free to move in only one dimension, then after one second, this particle can either be located two meters to the right of its initial location or two meters to the left of its initial location. If this particle is free to move in two dimensions, then after one second, this particle can be located anywhere on the circle centered at its initial location with radius 2 meters. And if this particle is free to move in three dimensions, then after one second, the particle can be located anywhere on the sphere centered at its initial location with radius 2 meters. So a much better description of the motion of the particle is one that gives not only its speed, but also its direction of motion Now, one way to give direction is in terms of the cardinal directions. So, for example, I could say that the object has a speed of 2 meters per second due east, in which case, after one second, I know that the object is located two meters to the east of its initial location. Another way that we could give the direction is to state that the speed of the object is equal to two meters per second along an azimuth of 90 degrees. But the important concept to realize is that we're giving a description of the motion of the object that includes both a magnitude and a direction. And so in general, 
motion is best described by vectors, which are quantities that have both magnitude and direction. Okay, so we'll end here for today. Next time we will begin to develop models for motion in one dimension. So I hope you have enjoyed the first lecture. Thanks for watching.